Today's podcast, I'm going to be talking a little bit about private money lending. And this is where you lend your money to a more active investor and you're the past investor and you're typically getting like 8 to 15% return. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out and then he became one real investor man. What's up, Simple Passive Cash Flow listeners? If you're looking to join in our opportunities, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash club and get in on the deal flow. You'll get access to all the goodies in our Google Drive and you'll get prompted to get a free 15-minute strategy call with me so we can get to know each other a little bit better. If you've been lurking and listening on the podcast, I want to hear from you and I want to help you out, get you going for the new year. So again, that's simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. Today's podcast, I'm going to be talking a little bit about lending, private money lending. And this is where you lend your money to a more active investor, as, and you're the past investor, and you're typically getting a, anywhere from like 8 to 15% return. Now, the caveat there that this is an active return in terms of taxes And it is not, um, there's no depreciation coming back at you for this. If you guys want to follow along and go to the show notes and the info page, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash lend, where we've done a previous webinar on this topic. But today, what I wanted to hash out, because in the past year, I've had some students in the mastermind do some private money lending, and some of these deals have gone bad. So what I wanted to do today is I had, I made an addition to this article and these are the top 10 mistakes that I have seen people um, go wrong with when lending, um, doing private money lending. So number one here, never buy a note or something you wouldn't want to own. And when I say this, like, you know, because you always have to understand that if things don't go well, and sometimes they don't you might have to take over the property. And that's the nice thing about private money lending is that you own title. It's a collateralized loan. Um, Some of the worst situations are when you're in a deal with non-collateralized debt. You know, and what that means in layman's terms is if the guy screws up, you don't have any asset or you're not protected. Consider the worst case scenario here where if you're the, the borrower defaults, you take it over, Do you really want to take that thing over? Don't. Maybe you should reconsider your loan-to-value calculations. And just so nobody gets left behind, the loan-to-value calculation is a great way to start out assessing the risk. So if you're taking over a property that's $80,000 and you're giving them a $100,000 loan, you've got an 80% loan-to-value. Typically, you want to stay anywhere from the 60 to 80% range. If something does happen and the borrower does default, you know, maybe you can cut losses at 20% and, you know, there's always going to be friction costs and headache costs. At least that way you're covered. Your original investment is, is covered there. Number two. So if the loan does go into default, make sure you take immediate action and start the timeline, just like an eviction. You know, there's a procedures on this. Again, this is where it's nice to be working with people, you know, like, or trust, you know, they, they could go into default but they could act in a very, very professional matter. And, um, but you, what you still want to do is follow the timeline because there are procedures and different in every state. I'm not familiar with all of them, but that's where you get a lawyer involved in that jurisdiction to represent you. Uh, number three here, do not loan money to someone you would feel uncomfortable for foreclosing on, such as a friend or relative. So sometimes you got to foreclose and you got to do what's necessary. Number four, if you're lending money on repairs, you might want to originate a separate note with a higher interest rate with separate collateral, not to encumber the first original asset with debt. This will do is put you in a lower leverage position if you ever have to collect. So what we're talking about here is most times what you're going to do is you're going to go on first lien onto the property and you know first lien is important because you're first in line to collect if you're the second or third lien holder imagine getting in line second and third now what we're talking about here is you know if if sometimes what they'll do is they'll get a the, the flipper or the active real estate operator will 
ask for a loan for the repairs. They might get you or they might get somebody else to lend on the actual acquisition of the property, but they may need more money for the repairs. At this point in time, you got to ask yourself, how are you covered? What's your collateralized debt here? Are they going to encumber the property? Because if they are, well, they're probably putting you in second place there. So it's just something I think about. If you're going to go in second position, now I would probably be looking at more of a 12 to even a 20% interest rate because that's much higher risk level. Number five, put yourself in the shoes of a flipper or active real estate operator. Now, if you're losing money, um, you have to pay rent. You got to put food on the table. What will happen a lot of times is these guys will pay Paul to uh, rob Peter or vice versa. And even though they're paying you the monthly installments, you don't know if the borrower is getting into financial trouble. So just be aware that this could happen. Be looking out for the signs. And this is where it comes into knowing people personally. And sometimes you can kind of keep track of them. I mean, it's your money. You can do it however you want. Social media is a good use for this. Number six, if you don't know what you should get in terms of interest rate, or you don't know how to evaluate the risk, get a mentor or hire a third-party professional who will give you their opinion of the deal. Don't go into a sucker deal, even if they're offering you 12 to 15%. So this is very uh, common. You know, Most newer investors will just be shopping based on rate. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you, let's just say, for example, you're taking a first lien on a property. Like I said, anywhere from 8 to 12% is the normal range. But if you're working with a newbie, I mean, I wouldn't even invest in that type of deal. But if you had to, maybe uh, 15 or 20% might be fair for that type of deal. A lot of people in my uh, Collective Genius Mastermind, you know, these are the pros flipping over 100 houses per year. They have investors that will lend money to them at, you know, low single digits, which is crazy. Um, I'd sure like to get some of those guys to invest with me, but you know, that's, that's what reliability does. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, if something is very reliable, you know, it's a lower risk and, um, you know, they, they've earned it. They earned the right to pay 5% for money. Um, that's what you call cheap money. Number seven, get lenders title insurance for the loan. And now the purpose of this title insurance is to shift the risk away from you to the title company when cr creating a real estate note. Number eight, very similar to title insurance, get property insurance on the deal that, and make sure you're named as an additional insured. I don't think it costs any more or it might, not pretty, may, might be pretty negligible, but in a remote chance that there's any issues like a construction worker falls or any kind of lawsuit, um, you know, you're sort of involved in the deal, even if you're in a limited partner type of uh, facet. You, know, you could be named in a lawsuit. Plus you as the lender probably has more to lose than the flipper because the flipper is the one since they're borrowing the money. Typically, they're not in pretty good financial straight. Most times house flippers are pretty broke. They're active real estate operators. And um, you know, unless they have a lot of rental properties, their net worth isn't typically as high as it seems. And in a lawsuit, the deeper pockets are always the ones that are kind of targeted first. Number nine, insist that the borrower provide you with evidence of payment when property taxes, insurance, and homeowners association fees become due and are paid. You can look up your property taxes on your own typically and see, and you can probably put in the property address and see if that's been paid. With the insurance and the homeowners association fees, you're going to have to do a little bit digging on it. Um, you know, I think the saying goes, trust but verify here. You can also set up your loan servicer to um, collect, to escrow the pre-collection of these funds also. Um, and number 10 here, get a personal guarantee if you're going to lend to an entity or an individual with some weakness. Now, LLCs are a way that people can hide behind them and fold up. Um, one way of protecting yourself is to have the borrower execute a deed in lieu of foreclosure and send it to you for, for your custodian. Should the borrower default, you can record the deed in lieu 
and take over the property to save the expense and time of foreclosure. Now, there's, there's a lot more information on private money lending on the page at simplepassivecashflow.com slash lend. But me personally, I kind of moved away from private money lending. I like my infinite banking strategy to make low single digits uh, when my money's not doing anything, but I try and keep my money in higher IR type of deals that are value add and cash flowing day one, such as um, multifamily apartments or mobile home parks. These days, I'm kind of playing around with some oil and gas investments. And what I don't like about private money lending is that you're a debt investor. You're not an equity investor. Equity investors have more upside. Another mistake I see is a lot of the lower net worth guys seem to be doing the private money lending and it's completely the opposite. The, the people with the lower net worth need to be going after equity deals. You know, let the guys with two, three million dollars net worth in their Roth IRAs or their self directed IRAs do the private money lending at high single digits. Um, those guys don't really need to grow their money. And hopefully, they're working with people they know, like, or trust. But, you know, it's the people who go to the local RIAs or these kind of newbie groups are the people investing in, or what I say, kind of suckered into these deals as private money lending, when really they should just be going into private placements and actually good deals out there. But again, you know, that requires a good network and um, to be a little bit more experienced. Um, but if you guys have any uh, questions, feel free to shoot me an email at lane at simple passive cash flow. And we'll catch you guys next time. Aloha.